After T and D, we tend to get nasal release, so rather than feeding or feeding, you can often get just feeding. Feeding time in the zoo. In the case of thing, Londoners often add that extra voiceless plosive. So rather than something, they will say something. Or indeed reduce that further to something. And in the north of England, in a, not just in the north, in various parts, we have a form of somewhat instead of something, which might take the form of summit or summit. I want someone to say it to you, something to say to you. Similarly, anything, anything, can have an extra K at the end, anything, or we get like F for third, which we'll look at in a minute, anything. And the corresponding word to summit is then the word ought, A-U-G-H-T, which may well be pronounced out, out. The northern proverb is you don't get out for now. You don't get out for now, meaning you don't get anything for nothing. You have to pay for what you want. Okay, those are some general things. Now, the next group I want to look at is basically London innovations, which at the moment are on the whole, characteristic just of London speech or the southeast, but are clearly spreading. And the first of these is what we call TH fronting. This applies to the dental fricatives, the sound spelt with the letters TH. And what happens to them is they become labiodental. So instead of thing, we get fing. Fing. Would you just like to try that? Fing. Fing, 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 yeah. And um, it's interesting if we look at various kinds of English because there are varieties of English where th gets replaced by plosive. The West Indies, for example, where people say ting rather than thing. What's that, ting? Uh, you get this in Ireland as well. There's the fronting we've got here, thing. And of course, foreign learners often say sing, some sing, with an alveolar fricative. It's worth pointing out that no native speakers do that. Absolutely no native speakers use S for TH. So uh, if you want to sound native and you want an easy life, this is what you should do. And when you're counting, you should go one, two, three, rather than one, two, three, or one, two, three, or of course what I do, one, two, three. Mouth becomes mouth, mother becomes mother. That's the voice of the word. Mother, father, brother. That's the London 33, or the London drop and stop 33. 33. Next London innovation that seems to be spreading fast is what we call L vocalization. This affects dark L. Dark L, the L we use before a consonant, or finally, or wherever you get dark L, people are beginning not to bother with the tongue tip articulation, leaving behind just a back vowel articulation. So what I call milk, 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 then becomes milk, milk. And because a back vowel universally tends to be rounded, and certainly in European languages tends to be rounded, we get milk, milk, with lip rounding as well. So have, a, have some milk to drink. There are some other pictures, that's a seashell, shell, that's a bowl, a large bowl, bowl, uh, and then we have a, well, some bottles that have the milk in them, bottles or bottles, bottles, Pencil to write with, pencil, and there of course is the great wall of China, the wall, wall, wall. Well, we tend to think of this as a London characteristic, but it does seem to be spreading, not as fast as TH fronting, but it's clearly spreading. The third very important innovation happening at present in Britain is what we call glottaling, T-glottaling. 
And this applies to the voiceless alveolar plosive, the T consonant, when it's in non-initial positions. So particularly at the end of a word, there's a picture of a rabbit, a rabbit, and uh, there's one in the middle of a word, a butterfly. There's a rather old-fashioned printer. I must change that picture because computer printers don't look like that anymore these days. Anyhow, a printer. And there is a kettle. Now, in kettle for kettle, you can see two things. The glottaling of the T, ket, and the vocalization of the L. So that from kettle, we derive kettle. And that is the way things are going. I'm not sure if I've got another screen about no. Let's just talk about it a bit more. It applies to some words in received pronunciation. In a word like atmosphere, it's entirely acceptable within all kinds of English English speech to use a glottal stop, that is to say atmosphere or depart. But department, that is before a nasal, a non-syllabic nasal. I would always speak of the Department of Phonetics Department. I can say department, but it's very extra careful and not my normal pronunciation. Not my normal pronunciation, not my normal pronunciation. Mm -hmm. So there are some environments where this is used at all levels of society. In other, level, in, in other positions, it's socially sensitive, so that uh, we have differences depending on people's social class, level of education, and age, because it's spreading. So, uh, if we have something like take it out, take it out, I would always use alveolar T's there, but you can hear plenty of people, younger people, educated younger people saying, take it, take it out, take it out, take it out, take it out. Or indeed the other possibility, which is voicing the T like the Americans do, take it out, take it out. We'll come back to that later. In a phrase like quite nice, quite nice for the bottle stop is fine. In a phrase like quite easy, I wouldn't say quite easy, but if I were 40 years younger, I probably would. Quite easy for quite easy. So it's spreading both geographically and chronologically. Now, another London characteristic, southeastern characteristic, is what we call the diphthong shift. This is a change in various long vowels and diphthongs, most noticeable in the vowels A and I. Now, there's a picture of a face. This has a fairly narrow diphthong in my kind of pronunciation. A, 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 face, face, face. Well, what's happening to this is it's becoming a wider diphthong. So the starting point, instead of being N, is more like A. So you get face, face. This is more face, 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 face. You get this in Australian English, for example. So it's been around for 200 years, perhaps. Face, face, face. And in London, you can hear both of those varieties, face, face, very regularly. In London, you also get a wider version still, where the starting point is about ah, face. It's not face, isn't it? Face, face, face. So we've got at least these three stages, face, face, face. And uh, each is evaluated socially. The uh, corresponding change in the eye of price involves backing the vowel. So rather than the price that perhaps we started off with, that in the north of England you still often hear price with a very frontage vowel, you get a backer price, price. This is perhaps a London thing, but it's moving up market as we say. Uh, you will hear plenty of educated people also say price with an I, price, price. The London speciality on top of that is to round it. So that not just price, but price, price. What's a price? Price. 
These changes apply not just to the, these two words, of course. These are key words for entire lexical sets. Today, I'm not wearing a, a tie. But if I were, I call it a tie. But Londoners might well call it a tie, or indeed a toy. Mm -hmm. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> Six, seven, eight. eight. <laughs> Nine. Now, those were general things. There is also an interesting development which is restricted to a very small number of words. In American English, as you may know, NT gets reduced to plain N all over the place. So the season of winter, summer and winter, in American English they can say summer and winter. Winner. We can't do that. Nobody in England says winner for winter. But we do do a similar reduction in one or two special words. The numeral 20 is one. You will hear plenty of people saying 20 for 20. So 20, 21, 22, 23. It uh, is sort of informal. Uh, among younger people, at any rate, it appears to be part of RP now, although it wasn't for my generation. Also in the word plenty, plenty, got plenty of things to do, plenty, plenty to eat. And in the case of want, when you have either want to or wanted or want plus eat, we get loss of the T, so I want to be free. Well, that's an American thing, of course, for the monkeys, because you get this in American English, why are you free? Uh, past tense, wanted. I wanted. And the last word in which this happens is wet. Went away, went off, wet is followed by a Now, as far as I'm aware, in English English, those are the only cases in which we get complete loss of the teed. You can, of course, get glottally of the teed, which is another matter. We have to distinguish between glottal stop, which involves a momentary silence, plenty went away from uh, complete loss of it, which is what I'm talking about here in full NT reduction. So, ongoing process is interesting to keep an eye on. Now I want to look at one or two matters which are regional within England and are very well known differences between different local varieties. In words like sing, historically we used to have g, a voice feeder closely at the end. Historically it used to be sing, sing. This pronunciation with a g was lost in most kinds of English. We deleted final g after even the nasal. So historical sing became sing. Singing became singing. A singer became a singer. But in one area, sort of northwest of England, this change didn't happen or was resisted. And this applies particularly, for example, to the speech of the cities of Birmingham, Manchester, and Liverpool, so quite big population centres, and to the places in between where the gut is retained, so you can hear somebody saying, I'm a singer, a singer rather than a singer, I'm singing a song. <clears throat> All the other words in in the same way, so instead of hang up, you get hang up, instead of long ago, long ago, and so on. So that's retention of this final go. Although this is regional and indeed social, it has a very low profile. That is to say, people are not aware of it. When you point this out to people from Liverpool or whatever, they're quite surprised. They haven't realized that they do something different from people in the south of England or in Scotland. A useful pair for testing it is to compare singer, someone who sings, with finger on your hand. If you ask me how to pronounce those words, I say singer and finger, singer, finger, singer, finger. You can hear the difference. But if I came from uh, Liverpool or Birmingham, I might well say 
finger, 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 and they'd be a perfect rhyme. <coughs> Perhaps the best known north-south difference in England concerns words in the lexical set strut. Words like love, money, to cut something in half. Where historically we had a book vowel, that is a short, close, back vowel. This changed some centuries ago into the art that we know today. So the word cut, to cut something in half, used to be cut, cut it in half, changed gradually to cut, cut, that we say nowadays cut, and indeed the cap that you can hear from London is even greater. But this change was rather mysterious, historically speaking, because it didn't apply to all of the words that had U. Some words got left behind. So to put something down remains everywhere as put. And this means that we've had a phoneme split, really. Cut changed to cut, but put stayed as put with the result that in most kinds of English, cut and put do not, sorry, cut and put do not uh -huh. rhyme. That was intention, yes. <laughs> put and cut don't rhyme. But in the north of England, where this change was resisted, they tend still to rhyme, cut and put. I just cut it up for you, cut it up. London, cut it up. American, cut it up different from put. Another pair there is for <coughs> and done. <coughs> Again, the spelling sort of tells you this. The spelling shows that these were the same vowel, for dull. But now we pronounce them differently because the change happened in dull become dull, but didn't happen in full, which was remained as full. There are also words with double O spelling, like foot, which is our key word for one of these sets. But some words with double O spelling didn't change, so blood and flood spelled with double O, unlike foot, but it changed into the one. Now, in the case of people who grew up in an up area but have risen in the world, socially speaking, you do sometimes get a kind of hypercorrection. Upwardly mobile northerners, as we might say, because they readily change cut into cut, or some halfway stage, perhaps all the way to cut, but they tend to overdo it and change put as well to put, or indeed all the way to pat. So as soon as you hear somebody talking about sugar, would you pass them the sugar, you know that's a northerner, because mm -hmm. southerners and Scots and Irish and Americans and everybody else says sugar. Pass me the sugar, pass me the sugar. Northerners overdoing the correction. Because it seems like a good idea to change your love to love. You get sugar changing to sugar. Now, slightly more technically, the consequence of this phoneme split that happened in the south and in RB in most areas, but not in the north, is that the number of short vowels in the system is different. It means that in the southern system that we have in our B and so on the left there, we have six stressable short vowels, six strong short vowels, it, e, a, a, o, o, kit, dress, track, strut, lot, foot. But in the north, we have only five strong short vowels, only five Stressable short vowels, I, E, A, O, U. I've used slightly different phonetic symbols because they are typically slightly different phonetically, but the difference is not terribly important. So we have kit, dress, trap, lot, and foot, and strut with the same vowel. So those of you who understand about linguistic systems, 
we'll see that this is really quite a deep set distinction, not just a superficial phonetic matter of realization, but a, a deeper one of the system uh, of short powers that we have there. This is why we get the problems of hypercorrection, because to go from a smaller system to a bigger system is always problematic. The other very well-known northern feature between the north and the south of England concerns the lexical set Bath. Because historically this had a short vowel, and so it was something like Bath. And likewise, a whole lot of other common words there I've listed. What are now in our feet? Pass, glass, grass, staff, raft, laugh, path, yes, path, after, castle. You may notice that in each case we've got a voiceless fricative after the vowel. Well, these were historically pass, glass, grass, staff, raft, laugh, path, path, after, castle. And in this position, before a voiceless fricative, we got this change, broadening the vowel, making it longer, and back, giving us our present day bath, pass, glass, and so on. But as with the foot strut split, we have a somewhat mysterious failure of this change in certain words. All there were other complications, words borrowed, words that entered the language, words that are shortenings, which mean that we often still get an before the same consonants. So, for example, mathematics is commonly shorted, shortened to maths, or in American English, to math, and that's maths. Nobody says maths for that. The physical concept of mass, weight and mass, is still pronounced mass. It hasn't changed to mass. You will very occasionally hear mass for the name of the religious service, though that too is usually mass. We joke that it's only Catholics who have mass. We do not to say Catholics with mass. And we have non-rhyming pairs, castle compared with tassel. Pass compared with gas. For some reason, the change didn't apply before voiceless sh, although patio alveolar voiceless fricative is a voiceless fricative. The change never happened before that, so we keep dash and mash and rash and so on. Well, this change was resisted in the north of England and also, as you may well know, in North America. So Americans, generally speaking, have the many descendants of the short vowel, not of the long vowel. Americans use a different vowel in bath than they do in father. In the south of England and Narki, we have the same vowel in bath and in father. It's a very well-known north-south difference in England, but unlike the business of strut strut, northerners on the whole resist social pressure to change their vowel in these words. So you get plenty of people who speak with really what's not a regional accent at all, virtually receive pronunciation except for this one thing. That they will have a bath rather than having a bath. I have to say there are other northerners such as myself who uh, use the long R because I did grow up in the north of England. On the other hand, I went to school in the south, which uh, means I was exposed as a young boy really to the long vowel, and I came to associate that with my everyday speech, so I would switch into saying bath if I wanted. But my parents, anyhow, said bath, so that's what we had in our family. Thank you. There are some maps. Ben Collins may recognize them. They come from his book, uh, Collins and Base. Uh, the first one is just really to show you the names of the counties which people refer to, which is useful to have. I'm not going to really refer to that today, but on the right-hand side we see a map for R in Bath words, and you'll see that the long R is characteristic of the southeast, London and the surrounding regions. The 
short vowel is characteristic of the north of England. Scotland's a bit of a grey area, as we might say. But also the southwest is somewhat problematic because uh, they tend not to have a contrast, though they may have allophonic lengthening, bath, that kind of thing, but also gas for gas. The other map, the one on the bottom right, shows you the northern area where we get to put in strut, the strut words, which is nicely between the south of England, Wales, and Scotland, where this doesn't happen. And then Ireland is a bit of a grey area because you sometimes get contrasts in Ireland, sometimes not. Some words go as in the north of England, some words go as in the south of England. Complicated position in Ireland. Summarising the point about the Bath words, you can see that in a typical southern accent, we have the short an in track, and all of the words in the lexical set track. But we have a lot of R in Bath and Start and all of the words in those two lexical sets. So if we take the three words gas, pass, farce, you can see the results. In the north of England, typically, on the other hand, we have their short A, which is not quite so close, in trap and bath and those two lexical sets. But Long R, which is qualitatively not actually very different, in the lexical set start. And this means we get gas and pass and pass. Now, I have to emphasize this to my uh, native speaking undergraduates, perhaps not so important for you. Southerners often imagine that Northerners simply have a short A everywhere that Southerners have R. So they imagine that Northerners say not only bath, but also stat for start. That's not true. A pair like ham versus arm, H-A-R-N, is different not only in the south, but also in the north. Though the difference in the north may be mainly one of length, duration, ham, ham, or indeed ham, ham, rather than one involving quality as well as Now, we have already talked briefly about the A and the diphthong shift that was involved in face becoming face. <coughs> Actually, this is the sort of second stage because earlier, face had a monophthong. Where does this word come from? Is it Germanic? No, it's not. It's a borrowing from French. All right, the French now say visage, but clearly at the time, of borrowing, a thousand years ago, the French said face, which remains as a word in French, but with a different specialization of meaning. So this came into English as face, face, face. We had the great vowel shift 600 years ago that changed a into a. Another French word, table. The German word is tisch, board. We retain it in the expression sideboard. <coughs> Head and board. Okay, table from French, tab becomes tail, tail. And then later that a gets its diphthong, ta table, face, face, face. But this diphthonging didn't happen everywhere. So, in, how can I put this, parts remote from London, we often get monophthongs still. So, in Welsh English, face, in Scottish English, face. In Irish English, face. Indeed, in Minnesotan English, in parts of the States, face, you can get very much of a monophthong in this set of words. Now, what is very interesting is that there is another set that have a diphthong everywhere. These are words, no, absolutely not an accurate statement, that may have a diphthong more widely. So if we take the number eight, that GH spelling tells you about an ancient consonant, vela becoming palatal, that was a once upon a time there, aged sort of thing, which was then lost, leaving a diphthong eight. And there are some accents where there's a difference between the vowel of eight and the vowel of lit. 
Okay, these words rhyme perfectly in most kinds of English, eight late, but there are varieties that have a contrast. Uh, I would think particularly of South Wales, the Swansea Valley, because this was a, an epiphany moment for me when I was a junior lecturer and I was teaching elementary phonetic transcription to a class of native speakers here at UCL. And uh, one of my students, a bright student, complained at the list of keywords. He said, how can I show that eight is different from late? Because it is. And in his speech it was, and I checked it out. Yeah, he would say straight, late, wait. But he'd say late, place, face, name. And there's a clear difference. And so I had to give him an extra symbol. And uh, that's this Swansea Valley of South Wales uh, where people make this difference. And uh, there are actually people also in the north of England who do the same sort of thing and say eight, but late. The corresponding thing with back vowels, uh, goat, well it was goat, monothon, that remains in various areas a long way from London, goat, goat. And that then diphthongized into goat, goat, goat. That's an old-fashioned old pronunciation, which you don't really hear anymore in RP, though a hundred years ago you would have done. Daniel Jones, Jones, I think probably said O. Oh. Uh, well, this lost its rounding, we've got a more central starting point to the O we know and love today. Goat, goat, goat. In London, it's moved on further to gout. And you hear really where are there are a wide variety of possibilities in that class of words. Again, there was a possible contrast because there were other words that had a diphthong even where or had a monophthong. So in South Wales again, in parts of South Wales, we have this distinction between tor on your foot, that's my tor, and toll to pull along. A tow truck. And my <coughs> Swansea Valley student had this contrast as well, and I had to give them an extra phonetic symbol for this contrast. And again, you'll find it in parts of the north of England, toll, or it may indeed be tau, uh, as against tall. Whose face is that? Chomsky. Chomsky yeah. <clears throat> Another historical development is R dropping. This is a sort of very important and far-reaching thing. In the earlier forms of English, everywhere, up to about 300, 400 years ago, there was an R pronounced wherever you see the letter R in the spelling. So that's a farmer. Farmer. The Americans, of course, have retained this R. Farmer. Farmer. So have the Scots. Farmer. So have people in the west of England to some extent, farmer, though it's now in retreat, giving way to farmer, which is the way this word is pronounced in the southeast. So this word exemplifies the two positions where this happens, before a consonant and finally. One that is still ongoing is the loss of the voiceless element in words spelt with WH. So historical why becoming why, when becoming when, which becoming which. This really has completed its change in uh, England, except that people have a kind of ancestral memory of the quote possibility and may regard it as a more elegant variety, though often nowadays don't. But in Scotland, there are still plenty of people who say why and when, and in Ireland, and some in North America, though there too it is retreating fast and America is following the British lead in saying plain why, when, which. Minimal pairs like wine versus wine thereby disappear and become homophones, identical wine. Let's look at a few more North American things. Okay, we talked about R and R dropping, but the R didn't drop before various vowel changes that preceded it. So historically a word like bear was beer, with a long E, just like B, followed by an R, beer. That's what the spelling tells you. And in Scotland, beer is still the usual pronunciation. That's where, though, we got this 
development, E becomes air before R, so beer changed to beer. <coughs> Similarly, beard becomes beard. I put in beer and uh, because we'll see what happens in a moment when we look at the divergence of British and American English. All right, in British English, at least in English English, our beard, so on, we lose the R, so beer becomes beer. But we don't lose the R when the next word begins with a vowel, as in beer and and the R is preserved as linking R that you will have heard about. So linking R is a historical relic of an R that used to be present in all positions in this word. <coughs> Lost the beard becoming beard because there is a following consonant. In American English, what happens is the R is retained, but the vowel is simplified. It comes to be regarded just as a variety of the pit vowel. Beer, beer, beer and uh, skulls. And Americans don't have a separate ear phoneme on the whole. There are some New Yorkers and whatnot who do, but most Americans don't. They just have an A or D, an E before an R, and there's no separate symbol needed because there's no separate phoneme. If we take the word serious, we hear that it's got ear in our piece, serious, because that change happened before R. There are varieties of English English that say serious with E, not R, because they didn't have the same development exactly. <coughs> Americans, on the other hand, you can say serious. You can have to be serious, serious with a short E, just like in a word such as spirit. The other well-known American development is the unrounding of O in the lexical set lot. So here you get la, instead lot becomes lot, stop becomes stop, pop becomes pop, sock becomes sock, tom becomes tom, wasp becomes wasp. And that nice phrase, a bottle of scotch, in American English becomes a bottle of scotch. You got a bottle of scotch for me? You've got a bottle of scotch, English, English. Have you got a bottle of scotch? I've got a bottle of scotch. I've added length marks for the American transcription because another thing that happens in America is the loss of contrast, really, between long and short vowels. There's always a big quality difference. Uh, and the short vowels tend to get lengthened in particular positions. Some of the long vowels tend to get shorter than in British English. And uh, if we take the word bother, don't bother me, and compare it with father, you can hear that in my English there's quite a difference of duration. Bother, father, bother, father. In American English, you get bother, father. Don't bother me. He's my father. And it's the same. You know, they rhyme sometimes often as long. But for Americans, you really don't need to put in length marks at all. Oh, here we've got that set out. American, last, then, father, father. Now, a further development in American English that is still ongoing affects the lexical set thought. In more conservative American English, this is thought. Thought. Somewhat open the vowel than we use, but anyhow, it's on. But what's happening, particularly west of the Mississippi and in Canada, is that the or changes to r, or you lose the contrast, should we say, between the uh, to vowels or and R. So that thought becomes thought, do, uh, don, which is dan in American English, and dawn become identical as dan. So if someone in California introduces themselves to you and says, Hi, I'm Don. Well, <laughs> if it's a man, it'll be Don for Donald. If it's a woman, it'll be Dawn. In the east of the states, they're more likely to say, hi, I'm Dan, that's a man, or hi, I'm Don, that's a woman, with a contrast. Cotton Court is another minimal pair, which in Canada or in the west of the United States become identical as can't. 
Americans, as we said earlier, don't have any bath drawer link. Uh, one last important American innovation is tea voicing. In various positions, not quite the same as those where we use lots of stops, similar, you get voicing of tea in American English. So, atom becomes Adam. City becomes city. Better becomes better. And this means that Atom and Adam actually sound identical. Adam. Americans sometimes uh, deny this, but it's the case that it's been demonstrated by listening tests where you play Americans' ambiguous sentences. The wounded lamb lay bleeding by the fence. Did it bleat or did it bleed? And Americans answer at random. They can't hear the difference when that's pronounced by an American, when those two sentences are pronounced by Americans. Okay, so T voicing, uh, very noticeable to those who don't do it. I just like to point out the interesting fact that T is subject to three competing pressures depending on what kind of English we're talking about. And this shows you how marvelous phonetic classification is. All right, T, you alert, is a voiceless, alveolar, closely. Now, we can modify the place by changing it from alveolar to glottal, which gives us the London style, not only, but also, corresponding to the standard, not only, but also. Or we can modify the voicing, giving not only, but also, that's the American T voicing. Or we can modify the manner of articulation, changing it into some kind of fricative. So in Irish English, you get not only, but also, not <laughs> with kind of fricative, not quite the same as an S, but rather similar. You get this in uh, Liverpool speech as well. Or in the north of England, you've also got uh, the possibility of making it an approximate, nor only, nor only this, nor only this, nor also that. So you could modify any of the three categories, voicing, place, or manner. But you should have only one. Uh, one, I think this is the last screen, Australia, the land of kangaroo. Uh, lots of contrast between weak vowels. In Australian English, offices and officers tend to be the same, officers. Tended and tendered, the same as tendered. They borrowed from the Americans the T voicing, the T for tapping, flapping, so rather than better in Australian English, you often get better, better, but they don't use double stops like Londoners do. Front vowel in R, so ah, Australians tend to talk about a car bag rather than a car park, different shift like London. That, I think, is it. Thank you very much.